In our last review, I gave the Pi 64 2.5 out of 5. Have things really changed in the last two months? In the last review video of the Pine 64, we discovered that it didn't really do what it claimed to do. Can it be used for something else? Honey, where's the chopping board? Just in the usual place. Oh. Oh, here it is. Oops. So, if you injure yourself miles from civilization, the best way to avoid infection is to locate it. The genus Pinus, or commonly known as the pine tree. The sap of the tree provides an excellent antiseptic. You can obtain the sap simply enough by locating the seed pod and scrape the white residue being excreted from the board and simply apply liberally to your wound. Does it blend? So before I get started, I'd like to point out something. The Pine 64 was a Kickstarter, which means that you are not guaranteeing yourself of anything. You are a backer looking at helping fund the startup of a product or company, and like any venture capitalist, you will know that there's a certain element of risk. The Pine 64 Kickstarter campaign was, in my opinion, handled really badly. Had they done differently, then this would have been a really nice product. So let's see what's changed since my last review. Firstly, I need to see whether the latest kernel build has fixed a lot of the issues I had with the first release. There's a new image that was built and released back in July. So I'll give that a shot. Once installed and plugged in, I dove right into some basic GPIO tests with a simple LED on a breadboard and using low level methods of control, which worked okay. Excellent. Next I wired up my Max 7219 board to see if the SPI bus was accessible but the test program couldn't access the SPI bus. Well, this is why. There's the SPI dev module, and even when you load it up, the SPI device files don't appear. The Pine64 developers have provided some handy little hacking tools, one of them being to download and update your kernel. Once finished, I rebooted the Pine64, which ended up with the same result. Okay, so let's check out the forums. Apparently, there's been a bit of back and forth on this subject, and Longsleep has included the SPI dev kernel module in his latest DRM build. I didn't want to bother figuring out the kernel update script, so I just changed the URL at the top to point to Longsleep's DRM kernel file. Alas, the same result. So since the Pine64 uses the Linux device tree, time to look and see what has been set up. Once you've installed the device tree compiler, copy this file for safekeeping and run this command, which will save the device tree database as plain text. Fire up the editor of your choice and make these changes. The left side is the original file and the right side is what you need to change it to. All these changes will be on my website as well. Once finished, run this command to update and reboot. If you ever get these sorts of errors from dmessage, then you haven't updated the device tree file properly and left out a disable on the UART. If you look at the device tree file carefully, you'll see that it defines pins to be used. You can't have any overlapping pin definitions. Anyway, after all those changes, did it make any difference? No. You can always, as a last resort, download the wiring Pi tools, which gives you low-level bit bashing access to the GPIO. But that kind of defeats the purpose of having a SOC with I2C and SPI, doesn't it? If you're desperate, download, extract, and install the Debian packages. You'll find that wiring Pi is limited because it was originally designed for the Pi. It'll give you access to all the basics though. Clipper also pointed out to me the RPI GPO Python library, which hasn't been updated for four months. So I installed it to check it out. A simple heartbeat Python script showed that it worked, but it only gives you plain GPIO access no ITC or SPI. So I don't have any more time for this. My conclusion is that the Pine64 still isn't ready for the maker since it doesn't support a lot of the GPIO essentials. 
The next thing to check was the residue left behind during PCB manufacture. I originally thought it might have been some sort of flux residue, but on closer inspection found that it was solder paste. You can see all the tiny little balls of solder stuck to the board still. This means that they haven't cleaned it properly after soldering the SMDs and it runs the risk of shorting out the PCB tracks everywhere. Which reminds me, I should publish a video on the different soldering methods around. If you're desperate to clean it, then use a cotton bud dipped in metho. But this doesn't really clean it properly and you run the risk of pushing the solder balls into the PCB and shorting out something somewhere. You don't want to clean it in a flux remover bath because the board has BGA soldered on. A BGA is a way of soldering a high density component to a PCB. The component will have small balls of solder attached to the underside of the package. This then gets placed on the PCB and everything heated up so that the solder melts and joins to the PCB tracks. This is a highly precise method of soldering. If you go off and attempt to clean your board, you could push some of those tiny little balls of solder underneath the BGA package and short something out, not to mention all the other places solder can hide. In summary, just leave it dirty and don't touch it. One other thing I didn't do last time was run the Pharonix test suite on the Pi64. So I ran a battery of Pharonix tests without, of course, any graphics tests because there's still no proper graphics driver for it. You can look at the results on my website and a summary here. So then there's Android. Some people had no issues with Android, and I think as a plain Android SPC, it works okay. I tested this out last time, and I had the same opinion. But I have a real issue with company falsely stating capabilities. I guess in reality, it is possible for the Pi64 to be one of these things, but if it wasn't for people such as Longsleep and other developers working hard trying to get this board working, it would really be nowhere. I commend the Pi64 company for trying to get this board to market, but there's several things that I really don't. And so now we have other SBCs like the chip for $9. So where does that leave the Pi64? Frankly, I'm still maintaining my 2.5 out of 5 rating. It's not ready for the market, and it probably won't ever be. Oh wait, if you enjoyed this video then don't forget to like, and it'll be great to see you as a subscriber if you aren't already. So, see you next time.